afternoon, and thanks for coming. We're going to start our program of music from the dispatch side, uh, Women's History Month, with two contrasting pieces by Clara Schumann. Like her good friend, Joseph Joachim, Clara beat Schumann's reputation rested on her brilliance as a performer. Both were both gifted composers, but both eventually gave up composing to focus on performing. In Clara's case, the reason was practical rather than artistic. During her marriage, and especially after husband Robert Schumann's death, concert tours were the way she was able to support her large family. And as she lamented in 1841, not one little hour in the whole day is left for me. <laughs> Clara Wieck's father began training her from an early age for a great musical career as both a pianist and composer. She made her piano debut at age 11 and was already an acclaimed virtuoso when she married Robert. Theirs was a passionate relationship with music at the center of their lives. She was devoted to him and ardently promoted his work. But just as Fanny Mendelssohn let her music be published under her brother Felix's name, because few believed a woman capable of such an achievement, so did Clara allow songs she wrote to be published under the name of her husband's. Most of Clara's 23 published works were songs and short character pieces. Major exception was her piano trio in G minor, a complex and beautiful chamber work written in 1846 during a difficult period in her and Robert's life due to ill health. In the Andante movement we share with you today, arranged by John Gibson, Mendelssohn's influence can be heard, a romantic song without words with an agitated middle section and a lovely intertwining writing for all three instruments. It is interesting to note that Robert wrote his piano trio one year later, and it shows many similarities to Clara's. <laughs> Contrasting work is Clara Schumann's romance for piano. A London weekly newspaper called The Girl's Own Paper published a romance by Madame Schumann in October 1891, with no other information given. The readers understood that the composer was the esteemed pianist Clara Schumann, and this was the first publication of the work. Clara Schumann contributed a number of works to the paper, beginning at age 14 in 1833 with a song called a Walzer. The romance in A minor, Opus 21, it was dated June 1853, a few months before she met the young Johannes Brahms.
Florence Price, who lived from 1887 to 1953, was a pianist, organist, and composer. She was born in Little Rock, Arkansas, educated at the New England Conservatory of Music in Boston. She's the first African-American woman to be recognized as a symphonic composer and the first to have a composition played by a major orchestra, a performance of her first symphony by the Ch Chicago Symphony Orchestra at the 1933 World's Fair in New York. A prolific composer, Price published over 300 works, four symphonies, four concertos, a number of choral works, art songs, music for chamber and solo instruments, blending European classical music and themes derived from spirituals, folk music, and elements from traditional African music. We share with you today Elfentanz, a charming work which infuses the traditional minuet and trio form with a ragtime sensibility. <laughs> Thank you. 
get to take a break now. Um, composer and flutist Pamela Swar is a resident of Westchester County and a graduate of the Manus School of Music. Her composing career evolved naturally as an extension of her performing career. Many years of listening and playing professionally with outstanding artists and improvising co-created her original voice. Her first work, Flutes from the Other Side, was published in 2008. Pam remains equally passionate about playing, writing, hearing, and performing her compositions. She regrets that she can't join us today, but has provided the following program note. Day and night cannot dwell together are words attributed to the Suquamish and Duwamish leader, Chief Seattle, who believed in ecological responsibility and respect for Native Americans' land rights. The words mean just as day and night cannot exist this is together, the white man and Native American people cannot be together. However, Chief Seattle did forge friendship with a white settler named David Swinson, uh, Doc Maynard, one of Seattle's primary founders, and compared to other white settlers, a relative advocate of Native American rights. Maynard's friendship with Chief Seattle is important in the formation of the city of Seattle, and it was Maynard who proposed that it be named for this important chief. The words day and night cannot dwell together are part of a speech given during the signing of the Point Elliott Treaty of 1885, which guaranteed fishing rights and reservations for certain tribes, including the Suquamish Port Madison. Reservations were not designated for the Duwamish and some other Native American people. I have been a friend and sometimes collaborator with Pam since 2010, and it's very appropriate I first perform this on a concert that includes Joe Rakowski, who's been her friend for nearly a half century.
no cam friends for I mean, half a century, yeah. Um, uh, and maybe, uh, I, how, how many of you have ever heard of the, uh, the Woodstock Festival in 1969? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, raise your hand if you know someone that was there. Okay, now raise your hand if you were there. <laughs> anybody? Anybody? Oh, Pam Slow was there. I was hoping that maybe there would be somebody that met her there. I would remember Yeah. <laughs> That's right. If you, were, if you remember being there, you weren't there. Were you there? No, I wasn't. My mother wouldn't let me go. <laughs> Louisa Adolfa Lebeau was a German composer born in 1850. She composed her first work at the age of eight. She was a student of Clara Schumann, an unusual, unusually independent musician for a woman in 19th century Germany. Lebeau had a long and illustrious career as a concertpianist, music critic, pedagogue, and composer. Her music was heard worldwide, and several works were featured in conscious at the 1933 World's Fair. How many of you were there at that night? <laughs> <laughs> The Gavat we share with you today was written in 1882, and it features two themes, one stately and one almost martial, contrasting with a cheerful, lyrical musette. And this is originally a cello and piano, so thanks for letting me do this. <coughs>
Yer's musical talent is wide, ranging from traditional Jewish prayer modes to minimalist textures with rich melodic contours, and from joyful jazz-influenced rhythms to imaginative orchestrations of the natural world. At its core, it expresses her personal spiritual journey. This work was originally written for solo cello. Versions now exist for cello with string orchestra, cello choir, and cello and violin. The clarinet cello ar arrangement that we're performing today was created especially for Cross Island by its very gracious composer and appears on our CD, Quiet String, with Joe on clarinet and me on cello. It is an evocative and haunting musical representation of her visceral, spontaneous reaction to the collapse of the Twin Towers, the attack on the Pentagon, and the crash of the plane in Pennsylvania, rising to a powerful scream and then sinking into silence, like the settling of the ashes. The composer says of this work that it is her way of holding each other in our loss.
violinist and composer. She persevered through major challenges due to the 1966 Cultural Revolution, hiding her violin and practicing in secret, improvising variation on traditional themes. In 1986, she became the first woman in China to receive a master's degree in composition, and a concert of her music was presented on Chinese television. She emigrated to the U.S. later that year, where she earned a doctorate at Columbia University. She has served as composer in residence for the Women's Philharmonic, Chanticleer Vocal Ensemble, and Aptos Creative Arts Center, and as a professor of composition at the Peabody Conservatory, and currently the University of Missouri at Kansas City. Among her many honors, she has been awarded the prestigious Charles Ives Living Award and the Lily Boulanger Award, and the top prize from the China National Composition Competition. This romance, the romance of Xiao and Qin, it originally composed in 1995 for two violins and string orchestra, is intended to evoke the sounds of the Qin, a 2,000-year-old Chinese seven-string zither, and a shell, a vertical bamboo flute. The composer says that in this version, the cello transmits the lyrical sense of the show, representing her love for humanities, while the piano, sounding like an enlarged chin, symbolizes nature.
composer Ruth Schoenthal was born in Hamburg in 1924 of Viennese parents. She began composing at age five and became the youngest student ever accepted at the Stern Conservatory in Berlin. In the 1930s and early 40s, her family was forced to flee anti-Semitism first to Stockholm, then to Russia, then Japan, and then finally to Mexico City. There, Ruth continued her composition studies with Manuel Pons. While in Mexico, Chantal supported herself by playing piano in nightclubs, and she developed a talent for improvisation. In 1946, she met Paul Hindemith while he was on a Mexican tour, and he arranged for a scholarship for her to study at Yale. She graduated in 1948, one of the few to graduate with honors. Over the course of her life, she also lived in New Haven, New York City, and finally Scarsdale, where she died uh, in 2006. She followed her own musical path. She wrote for television and commercials, played the piano in various bars and clubs, and toured privately in New York, and for the latter part of her career was on the composition faculty at New York University. The tango we share with you today is an instrumental rarity written for this combination. Oh, I almost forgot, one of her students became quite famous. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of Stephanie Germ Germanata which she changed her name to Lady Gaga.
and, and actually it also has the war shower on it. Let's see. Okay. Um, should we go with uh, M for, for March? March. <laughs> or music. <laughs> yes, we have, we have one M. Any other M? No M. Statistically, that's amazing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fellow M, it's yours. Okay. Uh, Cecile Chaminade lived from 1857 to 19, 1944 and composed prolifically for most of her long life, producing over 400 works, almost all for piano or ensembles, including piano. In choosing to work as a composer, she defied conventional society, which limited women in music to the role of performer. She wrote almost exclusively for a female audience, which responded passionately and enthusiastically. Later in her life, she was even the object of a network of chaminade clubs, music clubs formed by fans to honor her. As a result of this focus, her music has often been relegated to the category of salon music, but it is far more substantive than that label would imply. The piano trio from which we are performing the first movement today, originally for the more standard instrumentation of violin, cello, and piano, is one of her early works, but it is characterized by assurance, elegance, and spirit, and is a very mature work. This first movement features beautiful melodic lines and a constant sense of forward momentum. And also worth pointing out, we started out on a G minor piano trio, and we're ending on a G minor piano trio by women whose names, first names began with C. Thank mm -hmm. you. 